Welcome to Anatomy and Physiology. This is lecture one of week three, where we'll be covering chapter 13, entitled The Peripheral Nervous System and Reflex Activity. In our studies last week, we looked at the central nervous system. This week, we turn to the peripheral nervous system, those things beyond the brain and spinal cord. In our studies, we'll be looking at sensory receptors and the various ways by which sensory receptors can be classified. We'll also be looking at the gross and microscopic anatomy of a nerve fiber before studying the 12 cranial nerves in detail. We'll then revisit chapter 12 to look at the spinal cord, then return back to chapter 13 to examine the 31 spinal nerves that innervate the body. Finally, to conclude this chapter, we'll briefly consider body innervation as well as reflex activity. We return back to our study of chapter 11 to consider the definition of our nervous system. Remember, the nervous system is a fast-acting control system. It responds to both internal as well as external changes in the environment, and it does so by activating effectors, either muscles or glands. In chapter 12, we looked at how the central nervous system assisted with that, and this week we're going to look at the second branch of the nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, found here in our flow chart. So we've considered central nervous system, now we're moving along to this side of our chart by looking at the peripheral nervous system. To begin today's lecture, let's ask ourselves, what is the peripheral nervous system? The peripheral nervous system includes all of the neural structures found outside of the brain and spinal cord and it's involved in conveying sensory information from the body and external environment via peripheral receptors along afferent fibers to the central nervous system, as well as it's involved with sending commands out to effectors, courtesy of the efferent fibers, to skeletal muscles. The peripheral nervous system is composed of the following five structures that we see listed here. We have sensory receptors that pick up information from our internal and external surroundings. We have afferent nerves that deliver information to our central nervous system. Once we're at the central nervous system, brain or spinal cord, that is part of the CNS. So we don't see that with our list, but then we're going to leave our central nervous system anew to consider the efferent nerves that send messages from central nervous system to various parts of our body. We we have ganglia or cell bodies of neurons found in the peripheral nervous system. And finally, we have motor endings, which was the topic of chapters 9 and 10 last term. As we spend our week learning about the peripheral nervous system, let's begin by examining and differentiating between two terms, sensation and perception. The idea of sensation is defined as the simple experience that arises from the stimulation of a sense organ, resulting in the transduction of a signal via light, sound, touch, taste, to an electrical signal our brain can process and integrate. When we're experiencing sensations, we experience things that lend to statements like, I see, I hear, I feel, I smell, or I taste something. Perception, on the other hand, is the process of organizing and interpreting the sensory information we receive from the periphery, taking raw information and transforming it into some kind of a meaningful experience. It's where a stimulus enters our conscious awareness, where we make sense of the input we receive from our sensory organs. It's the ability to create meaningful patterns from raw sensory information. So in this manner, we might hear statements like, I see a cat, or I hear a train whistle, or I feel the wind on my face, or I smell cinnamon, or I taste raspberries. Our textbook provides us an example of sensation and perception by giving this set of illustrations here in four parts. First of all, we're going to see a stoplight, and that's simply a stimulus. We see a color. The ability to differentiate that color is associated with our sensory receptors, so the driver's eyes detect the stimulus, detect that color green. That information will travel along afferent pathways to the brain where we make sense of that information. So we have a control center by which information is understood. And finally, in response to that, when we interpret and perceive what it is that light means, we then move through the intersection because it's a green light and we can go. So this is the textbook's example of these ideas of sensation versus perception. I'd like to turn now to the study of sensory receptors. We studied sensory receptors briefly in chapter five of last term when we looked at the integumentary system, where we learned that sensory receptors were responsible for gathering some kind of environmental stimuli, be that inside or outside the body, and sending the information that was collected 
along to the central nervous system for interpretation. When we consider sensory receptors, we can categorize them in one of three different categories or one of three different ways. First of all, by the type of stimulus that's detected, second, by the location by which those receptors are found, or third, by their structural complexity. First, we look at sensory receptors by considering their classification by stimulus type. That is to say, the type of stimulus has been detected. And with this in mind, we have five types of receptors. First, we have mechanoreceptors. These detect mechanical pressure to provide the sensation of touch, of pressure, of vibration, of proprioception. And that idea of proprioception, it's giving us the location, movement, and action of a part of a body. So we're thinking of things like, so we're thinking of receptors found in our joints associated with muscle, tendon, ligaments, and skin. We also have mechanoreceptors that help with hearing and equilibrium, more based on equilibrium, as well as they monitor stretching of blood vessels and internal organs. We also have thermoreceptors. These are receptors responsible for detecting changes in temperature. And we have photoreceptors, receptors that are responsible for detecting the light that strikes the retina of the eye. We have chemoreceptors, which detect chemicals in the mouth through taste, as well as chemicals or what we call odorants in the air, so via the nose through smell. Chemoreceptors can also detect body fluid chemistry, such as determining the concentrations of ions or gases found in the blood. And finally, we have nociceptors. Nociceptors are going to respond to stimuli resulting from physical or chemical damage to tissues of the body that result in pain. For instance, we may have thermoreceptors that detect temperature, but when temperature gets too high or too low, we don't feel the temperature itself, we simply feel pain. And those receptors that pick up that kind of stimulus are called nociceptors. Beyond classifying sensory receptors based on the type of stimulus detected, we can also classify sensory receptors based on their location in the body. We have three sensory receptors by which we categorize in this manner. We have extraceptors, interoceptors, and proprioceptors. The extraceptors are located at or near the body's surface, and these receptors are sensitive to stimuli that originate outside the body. Thus, they're providing information about our external environment. They aid in conveying visual information, smell and taste, touch, pressure, vibration. They pick up thermal cues. They pick up pain sensations. Second, we have interoceptors located in blood vessels, visceral organs, and the nervous system. So when we think of interoceptors, we are thinking of receptors that are picking up information within the body. These sensory receptors provide information about our internal environment, conveying impulses not often consciously perceived, but occasionally felt as pain or pressure. Finally, we have proprioceptors, and I mentioned this last slide. These are receptors located in association with muscles, tendons, ligaments, and joints, as well as the inner ear associated with the vestibular apparatus. Proprioceptors provide information about body position, about the muscle length and tension of a given muscle, about the position and motion of joints, as well as helps with equilibrium. We can also classify sensory receptors by their structural complexity, that is, on the structure of the receptors themselves. By lumping sensory receptors into either non-encapsulated or what we might call free nerve endings or encapsulated nerve endings. So we have two categories here of general sensory receptors. And we looked at some of these structures when we studied the integumentary system. You should be familiar with things called the Merkel cells, Meissner's corpuscles, Pacinian corpuscles, Ruffini structures or Ruffini corpuscles. We also saw free nerve endings move up through the dermis and touch right up against the deepest layer of the epidermis. Before moving on to look at the two general categories, I want to just point out that when we talk about general sensory receptors, this is in comparison to special sensory receptors, which are the topic of chapter 15 of our textbook. When we consider special sensory receptors, we're going to think about taste, we're going to think about smell, balance and equilibrium, and our sight. So at the moment, we're studying more general things than that. So first, non-encapsulated free nerve endings. These receptors have no complex sensory structure. They're the most common type of nerve endings, and they respond to pain or thermal stimuli, with some that are specialized around hairs to pick up light touch when hairs on the surface of the skin are moved. 
here, right here, we're going to see an example of non-encapsulated nerve endings. In contrast to these free nerve endings, we have encapsulated nerve endings, where the terminal ends of the sensory receptors are encased or encapsulated by connective tissue capsules. And so we see that idea right here. Our textbook provides some specific examples of both non-encapsulated as well as encapsulated nerve endings. In terms of our non-encapsulated or free nerve endings, we have vanilloid receptors. These are a special type of nociceptor associated with very noxious stimuli such as high temperature or low pH. We have itch receptors found near the skin surface, and these receptors are triggered by certain chemicals that we might find on our skin or deep to our skin. We have tactile or Merkel epithelial cells, and so we've seen those in association with chapter five. These are able to detect like touch as well as they wrap themselves around hair follicles and create that hair root plexus to detect movement of hairs projecting through the epidermis. All of these are non-encapsulated free nerve endings. In contrast, our textbook also provides examples of encapsulated nerve endings. And I'd like to just jump right ahead to the next slide and discuss each of these six encapsulated nerve endings. The first of our six major encapsulated nerve endings is that of our tactile, or the Meisner's corpuscles. These encapsulated receptors are associated with fine touch, with pressure, with slow vibrations. We say they can detect discriminative touch. And these are common in our fingertips, our hands, our lips, and our external genitalia. We say that these are found in hairless skin. Also back from chapter five, we had lamellar corpuscles. Back in chapter five, we also saw lamellar corpuscles, or now we see them using another term, pacinian corpuscles. These are widely distributed throughout the body. They're responsible for picking up things like fast vibration, pressure, and tickling sensations. And these tend to respond when pressure is first applied, but not necessarily as pressure is continued to be applied. We have Ruffini endings, sometimes called bulbous endings or corpuscles, and these are found deep in the dermis of our hands and the soles of our feet, where they are responsible for detecting skin stretch as well as deep continuous pressure. They're also used to identify and detect joint activity of our digits and our limbs. And these are found in the dermis as well as the hypodermis and in some of our joint capsules. We have muscle spindles. These are proprioceptors in skeletal muscle that participate in stretch reflexes. So finely controlled muscles involved in delicate muscle movement, such as activities of our fingers and eyes, we see lots and lots of muscle spindles. Whereas muscles involved in more forceful, coarse muscle movement, like we might see with our quadriceps or our hamstring group, have fewer muscle spindles. We also have tendon organs, another type of receptor located at the junction of a tendon and a muscle. And by initiating tendon reflexes, which we'll see later on in the unit, tendon organs protect tendons and their associated muscles from damage due to excessive tension. So this is going to help us detect when a muscle that's contracting needs to relax. Finally, we have something called joint kinesthetic receptors. These are proprioceptors found within and around the articular capsules of synovial joints, and they're responsible for providing information on joint motion as well as joint position. And this type of receptor is actually composed of various receptor types. So we're going to see some free nerve endings that respond to pressure, Ruffini corpuscles also responding to pressure. We see Pacinian or our lamellar corpuscles that are found in connective tissue that respond to joint movement like acceleration or deceleration. And we have some things that are similar to tendon organs that adjust reflex inhibition. So we're looking at adjacent muscles where there's some excess strain placed on joints. Although each of these receptor types sound pretty specific, all of the receptors on this slide, all six of these, are general sense receptors. They're found throughout the body. And again, this is going to be in contrast to our special sensory receptors we look at when we get to chapter 15. Next, I wanna switch gears. I wanna return back to a topic from last chapter. Specifically, I wanna look at something called the somatosensory system. 
somato, which means body, and sensory, which means related to some kind of sensation or physical sense. The somatosensory system is part of our sensory system serving the body wall and our limbs, and it processes information about several different modalities. Generally, a modality is defined as what is perceived after a given stimulus. It's what we might sense, like smell, touch, what we see, what we hear, what we taste, and this system informs us about objects in our external environment. We pick that information up through touch, that is the physical contact with our skin, as well as through proprioception, what our joints and muscles are telling us, or at least telling our central nervous system about our body position and movement. The somatosensory system monitors the temperature of our body, as well as the temperature in the external environment. It provides us information about stimuli that causes pain, that causes us to itch, causes us to feel a tickle. And we learned back in chapter 12, the somatosensory system is composed of two parts. We have that primary somatosensory cortex, as well as the somatosensory association cortex. Recall the primary somatosensory cortex was located on the post-central gyrus of each of our parietal lobes, and these areas receive nerve impulses from joints and tendons and muscles, telling us where our limbs are in relation to space. The job of this particular cortex is then to localize exactly the points of the body where sensations are originating. That idea is called spatial discrimination. The somatosensory association cortex, its responsibility, well, first of all, we'll say it's found just posterior to and receives input from the primary somatosensory area, as well as it can receive information from the thalamus. But ultimately, it aids in integrating and interpreting sensations, such as understanding what an object is by feeling its size and its texture. It looks at the storage of memories of past experiences to allow us to compare current sensations with previous ones. Now, one thing I want to note here, as we talk about primary somatosensory, this is the idea that we're taking in a sensation, we're aware of something, and it's with the help of the somatosensory association cortex of our cerebral cortex, that cortical area that helps then perceive information. We're going to interpret what that sensation means. Together, the primary somatosensory cortex, as well as the somatosensory association cortex, make up this somatosensory system. And this system is going to receive input from receptors in the body, which are related to the brain via extraceptors, interoceptors, and proprioceptors. The somatosensory system is designed in three levels. We have the receptor level by which we have sensory receptors, we have what's called a circuit level by which we see ascending pathways toward the central nervous system or toward the brain. And then we have the perceptual level, which is processing that takes place in the sensory areas of our cerebral cortex. So according to this image from our textbook, this is the area by which we have the receptor level. It's where we're going to find our receptors. And then that information via afferent pathways is going to move up toward the higher levels of the central nervous system via what we call the circuit level, by which we're going to route afferent fibers up to the thalamus, and then we have our perceptual level by which we will take that information and route it to the appropriate sensory area of our cerebral cortex. The first level of our somatosensory system includes processing at our receptor level. And most importantly, for sensation to occur, a stimulus needs to excite some kind of receptor. Thus, we're going to see these four different things take place for us to have success of processing at the receptor level. First, we need to have receptor specificity. The receptor must have specificity for the given stimulus. If the stimulus is sound, receptors of our inner ear pick up that stimulus. If the stimulus is a chemical in the air, we might have olfactory receptors of our nose that pick up chemical odorants in the air. Our inner ears aren't going to pick up the chemicals in the air, nor will our olfactory receptors pick up sound. So we need to have a receptor specific to the stimulus energy. Further, we need to ensure the stimulus is applied within the receptive field. For instance, when we're talking about touch, if receptors are located in the palms, but touch is taking place on our forearm or at our shoulder, then the receptors of our palms aren't going to be stimulated. We must also have something called transduction. That is, the energy of a stimulus must be converted into what we call a graded potential. Sometimes it's called the receptor potential. 
which then opens or closes some kind of an ion channel, thereby converting the stimulus to an electrical signal that can go on to the circuit level. And finally, those graded potentials in the associated sensory neuron must reach threshold, and only at threshold will a message be sent along to the next level of the somatosensory system, the inaction potential to the circuit level. Now there's a term I want to introduce before we move to the circuit level. I wanna talk about the term adaptation. A characteristic of most sensory receptors is that of adaptation, whereby we have a decrease in the perception of a sensation over time, even while a stimulus is still present. Some receptors are called quick adapters. They detect pressure, touch, and smell, but adapt very quickly, such that messages along to the circuit level die out quickly. Other receptors are called slow adapters, which adapt slowly and continue to trigger nerve impulses as long as the stimulus persists. Some receptors like pain receptors and proprioceptors don't exhibit adaptation at all. These are going to help us with our survival because in general, we should never adapt to pain. So adaptation we tend to find with those things like smell or sound, whereas we don't see adaptation with those sensory receptors that pick up more painful or life-threatening stimuli. Another way to look at adapting receptors is by looking at these two terms that we call tonic receptors and phasic receptors. Tonic receptors produce what we call a very constant rate of firing as long as the stimulus is applied. So this might be a pain receptor. We always want to know that pain is present. And so we see that here. With pain, we're going to see a stimulus applied and it will continue to be applied as long as the stimulus is there. In contrast, we have in contrast we have phasic receptors which produce a burst of activity as we might see right here but then quickly reduce the firing rate if the stimulus is maintained. And we might see that in situations of scent or of sound where we smell something and maybe you walk into a home that smells a bit like mildew or like a pet or like cigarettes, but gradually you become accustomed to that smell or you adapt because we have phasic receptors that are going to pick up that stimulus initially, but we see those action potentials decrease. Next, we look at processing at the circuit level. In this manner, we're considering the ascending pathways we call tracts that deliver sensory information up to the brain. And with this in mind, we're going to see what we call a three chain pathway involving what we call first order neurons, second order neurons, and third order neurons. Let's go ahead and we'll first look at our first order neurons. These neurons are going to conduct impulses from the sensory receptor. And so at that level, we're going to see movement of that first order neuron all the way to the central nervous system. So wherever that receptor is, we're going to see that neuron move all the way up to our central nervous system. And then we're going to see that first order neuron synapse with a second order neuron these neurons are going to reside in the spinal cord and transmit impulses to what we call third order sensory neurons, which we would see here. So we find synapsing taking place at the thalamus, and then we see that extension to our cerebral cortex, to one of those sensory areas. Now we might also see second order sensory neurons move directly to the cerebellum. And so in that case, we won't see a third order neuron. We just see second order neuron direct information directly to the cerebellum. But for all of those things that we route to the thalamus, which then are delivered to our cerebral cortex, we will rely on what we call a third order neuron. And so third order neurons carry messages from the thalamus along to the appropriate area of the cerebral cortex. Now we've pulled information from our environment. We sent it up through the circuit level, either to the thalamus, or the cerebellum. If we routed information to the cerebellum, we need to route it up to the cerebral cortex for integration at the perceptual level. We discussed perception at the beginning of lecture, where we said it's the process of organizing and interpreting the sensory information we receive so that we can transform it into some kind of a meaningful experience. And without knowing it, we might select, organize, interpret information, pass it through perceptual filters in order to make sense of that stimulus. Our textbook discusses different aspects of the perceptual level, and I'm going to go through these aspects with you now. 
First, we have what's called perceptual detection. That is, we must detect that the stimulus has occurred. And with this in mind, we may need to compile messages from various different receptors in order to perceive something. And we call that concept summation. We also rely on magnitude estimation. And so that term, we're using incoming signals to perceive the strength of a stimulus, ultimately determining its intensity such as how loud something is or how bright something is. We rely on spatial discrimination to help us identify the site of the stimulus or some kind of a pattern of the stimulus. And we also process at the perceptual level based on something called feature abstraction. This is used to identify a substance or some kind of a structure that has a very specific texture or a specific shape. Now the next term, quality discrimination, is something we'll consider in chapter 15 with our special senses. It's the ability to identify submodalities of a sensation. And the best example of this is taste. We can taste things and identify them individually. We might taste something, but we can then further categorize it as bitter, as sour, as sweet, maybe salty or umami. These are different ways by which we can categorize things with submodalities and the taste themselves, be it bitter, sour, etc., those are the submodalities of taste. And so that concept is quality discrimination. Finally, we have something called pattern recognition. So again, this is stuff that we're able to process at the perceptual level. Pattern recognition is the process by which visually presented objects are identified. Maybe we categorize them in a certain way, we name them. Ultimately, we have the ability to recognize patterns in stimuli. And so we might see that in association with melody in a piece of music or by identifying familiar faces amongst a sea of faces we haven't seen at any point before. As it pertains to perception, and with many of you planning a career in the medical field, let's go ahead now and talk about perception of pain. We see visceral pain and referred pain as two topics under this perception of pain. So in terms of visceral pain, that is pain that originates in the organs. When we have pain here, it tends to be described as some kind of a vague ache, maybe a gnawing pain, a burning sensation. Pain is commonly the result of chemicals, muscle spasms, sometimes even tissue stretching. Now, in contrast to that, we have referred pain. That is pain from one region of the body perceived as coming from another part of the body, when in fact, there's a different source of origin for the pain altogether. Referred pain occurs because sensory nerves from different regions of the body may converge on the same pathways, moving to the spinal cord and brain. And a classic example of referred pain is the phenomenon associated with a heart attack. The receptors from the heart, as well as the receptors from the left arm, travel by a shared pathway to the brain, and as a result, the brain can't isolate or identify the particular source of the pain. Another example is the gallbladder, and given shared pathways, pain from the gallbladder might be felt in the right shoulder. Referred pain can really make it challenging for healthcare providers to accurately identify the source of pain. But you know, when I talk about this topic with my in-person class, we talk about pain generally. I bring up the idea of a migraine and we go through class and we talk to students about what their experiences are with migraine. And what we tend to find is that everybody experiences a migraine differently and the symptoms are different. With that in mind, we tend to talk about that medical care facility question of what is your pain level between one and 10? Well, some people who've experienced significant pain in the past may have a different level of pain in association with what they're experiencing at that moment as compared to someone who hasn't experienced pain before. We tend to see, and I know this is stereotyping things, but childbirth, kidney stones are very, very painful. That's a 10, whereas other things might be less than a 10, but if you've never experienced childbirth, you've never experienced kidney stones, your idea of 10 might be different than someone else's. We're going to take a turn now and look at nerves and nerve structure before moving on to look at our cranial nerves and our spinal nerves. Recall nerves are simply bundles of axons packaged up together found in the peripheral nervous system. And similar to what we saw when we looked at muscles last term, we see connective tissue coverings associated with nerves. And so some of these terms are going to sound similar to what we saw with our muscles. First, we have what's called the endoneurium. And in terms of connective tissue, the endoneurium is a very delicate connective tissue. 
found surrounding individual axons. So that's what we're looking at here. And oftentimes that endonerium is going to cover the associated Schwann cells uh, with that given axon. So this connective tissue covering helps insulate and support and protect individual axons while also helping separate adjacent nerve fibers and preventing interference between them. We have the perineurium. So this connective tissue layer surrounds fascicles. Now we saw fascicles before, which were bundles of muscle fibers. Now we're going to see fascicles as bundles of axons making up nerve fibers. And with the perineurium, its primary function is to provide structural support while also protecting peripheral nerves. Finally, we have the epineurium, that outermost layer of connective tissue that's found surrounding an entire peripheral nerve. And it also serves in a protective nature, preventing nerves from being damaged due to external forces. It's going to help contain blood vessels that supply nerves with nutrients while removing wastes, and it further aids in insulating the nerve. And the epineurium also helps bind multiple fascicles together. We can take our peripheral nerves and group them into one of four different categories. Two types of sensory nerves, somatic and visceral, and two types of motor nerves, also somatic and visceral. Our somatic sensory nerves, so our first one here, we're talking about afferent fibers. We're going to see that those are going to travel up to the spinal cord and into the brain. These first are somatic sensory fibers. These are afferent fibers. And so we're going to see these fibers transfer information in the form of nerve impulses from our sensory receptors of our periphery to higher brain areas like the cerebral cortex or the cerebellum along an afferent pathway. We also have visceral sensory nerves. Our visceral sensory nerves are going to transfer information in the form of nerve impulses from sensory receptors of our visceral organs or of our vessels or of our glands along afferent pathways to those higher brain regions. Now, in contrast to sensory nerves, we also have two different motor nerve fibers. We have the somatic motor nerves, which follow efferent pathways, meaning information is relayed from the central nervous system out, in this case, to skeletal muscles. And further, we also have visceral motor nerves, also efferent, which take information from the central nervous system and route it to our viscera, so the organs, our visceral organs, typically directly to smooth muscles supporting the organs or directly to glands. While much of the body we've studied to date has the ability to undergo repair, like bone and our skin, the cells of our nervous system have very limited powers to undergo regeneration. So let's consider both the axons of the central nervous system as well as the axons of the peripheral nervous system to compare regeneration capacity. Now this slide, we're talking about central nervous system. So up through now in this lecture, we've talked about peripheral nervous system. We're just gonna take a, a hop back to the central nervous system where we're going to look at that possibility of regeneration of axons. And what we tend to see is that we have very little ability for regeneration. The neuroglia of our central nervous system tend to have inhibitory influences on regeneration. First, our astrocytes proliferate at the site of axon damage, forming a type of scar tissue that prevents regeneration. And so this is going to create both a physical and a biochemical barrier that impedes axon growth. Further, oligodendrocytes, the glial cells that make up our myelin, they inhibit regeneration of neurons by releasing things called inhibitory factors that prevent axon growth. And finally, there's the absence of growth stimulating cues in the central nervous system, and that's further going to inhibit axon regeneration. And so scientists can look at these obstacles. We have growth inhibiting proteins. We have potentially the ability to block receptors for those growth inhibiting proteins. And we might be able to devise ways to destroy the scar tissue components. These are all ways by which scientists might in the future be able to target ways to help with axon regeneration of the axons in our central nervous system. In contrast to axons of the central nervous system, axons of our peripheral nervous system have some ability to undergo repair, so long as the neuron cell body remains intact and so long as Schwann cells that produce myelin also remain active. 
Now with this in mind, there are four steps to peripheral nerve repair. First, we have the idea of degeneration. So following some kind of injury to a peripheral nerve, the damaged axons begin to degenerate through this very fancy process we call Wallerian degeneration. And at the site of injury, we find axons and fragments, part of myelin from damaged axons. We might find just general cellular debris. So we need to clean that area up. Now macrophages come in and clean the area distal to the injury, but we're going to see that myelin sheath remains intact. So that's just the cleanup process. We see macrophages come in. In the next step, we're going to see regeneration begin. After cell debris has been cleaned up, one of two things might happen and typically do happen simultaneously. First, we're going to see that the two damaged ends of an axon, they begin to sprout filaments in response to growth factors that are secreted by Schwann cells. So Schwann cells have remained in the area. They get some cues to multiply, which is great. We see a lot of Schwann cells in the area. Those Schwann cells are gonna release growth factors and we're going to see potentially some sprouting of filaments at the two ends of the axon damage. And then Schwann cells in the second part are going to line up along this damaged axon to form what we call a regeneration tube. So these tubes are found between the two damaged ends and they help guide or otherwise direct the axon sprouts so as to maximize repair. And then finally, we see axon regeneration. Schwann cells then return to producing myelin and they've helped bridge the two damaged ends of an axon together. Now, all this sounds great and fine, and it, it tends to work with some success for very clean cuts. But when we have mangled tissue, we see the two ends of an axon that have been damaged very far from one another. It's less likely we will see regeneration of axons. These images are taken from our textbook, and this is showing the four steps of peripheral axon regeneration. So we're going to see this step one here, step two, we're moving down here to step three until we get to step four. This is going to conclude our first lecture. When we come back for lecture number two, we're going to begin with a study of our cranial nerves. We'll look at the spinal cord as well as the spinal nerves that extend from the spinal cord, and we'll consider some other peripheral nervous system concepts. If you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Meanwhile, make it a great day.